Hartford Town Council meeting for November 2nd at 6.59. If I talk real slow, it'll get to 6.59 p.m. All council members are present. Uh, for those of you uh, watching at home on the Facebook live stream, if you are wishing to give public comment, public comment is done on the Zoom stream, so you'll have to pop over there if you're wanting to do public comment on an item. Uh, council, if you would please join me in honoring our nation. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. What I need is a chair that actually moves when you want to. All right, so uh, we're going to go ahead and move over to our Parker Chamber of Commerce updates. Um, I see Omar is on here. Are you here for the chamber tonight? Can you guys hear him? I there you can... go. I'm here as well. Okay, okay. okay. Kara, I can hear you. So whoever's here for the chamber, if you'll go ahead and give us your update then. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you so much for having us this evening. Um, the biggest thing we had recently with the Chamber is we just completed our top dog of Parker competition. It was just really successful. We had a lot of um, interaction from our whole community, putting their dogs out there. We made um, a little over $3,000, which is gonna go into a fund to help some of our Chamber members. So we were really excited about that turnout and just the, um, the support of our whole community. So that was a real positive thing. And we are just continuing and helping some of these businesses with um, getting some marketing going for them, advertising and just supporting their businesses um, and getting some things going for them, especially as we're heading into the holidays. So that is the main things going on with the chamber right now. We're looking forward to November and doing some more fundraising again to help some of our members who are struggling a bit with um, keeping their memberships and staying involved um, with our, our different um, programs and such. So that is it. Any questions for me this evening? Council, any questions for Kara? No? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Downtown Business Alliance updates. Omar, is that going to be you? If you if you're speaking, we can't hear you. I'll tell him to. Okay. He's not muted. Omar, when you're not hearing you. Is Chris on? I don't see anyone else. Okay. Oh, nope. no, no, it's connecting to audio. He was connecting and then he muted himself. Yeah. Omar, can you unmute yourself? Oh, good. It went off, went back. There you go. Okay. Sorry, guys. You're good. Go right ahead, Omar. All righty. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, Mayor and Town Council, thank you for having us tonight. My name is Omar Castillo and I'm the treasurer for the DBA. It's my honor and pleasure to present tonight on half the beef of the DBA. But before we get started, a few things I wanted to say. Tomorrow is a big night for Parker politics on the eve of this election night. I know a few of you up there are running for positions and some for other positions as well. And I wish you all the best of luck. For those of you finishing up your terms, I wish you the best of luck and thank you on behalf of all of us for what you've done for this great time great town of ours and appreciate your guys' time. So as far as what the DBA has been up to, uh, we want to just kind of highlight the memorial, the, uh, the mayoral debate that we did and the town council candidate forum that we did as well. Up to this point, we've had about a thousand views for both of the events. And first and foremost, we want to thank all the candidates that participated and everyone that did well and participated in these great events. It was a valuable product that has been recorded and is out there on the downtown Business Alliance website. And they've been out there so that can be viewed by all the people of Parker. Number two, the other item we're working on is continuing to do our due diligence on the planner and entertainment decks. <clears throat> Currently still working with town regarding the design requirements and solidifying the numbers of each of those items that we need for those decks as well as for those planners. So more to come on that. Uh, number three, we're getting ready to do, work on some trash pickup along Pikes Peak. That'll be on uh, November 13th 
uh, coming up next Friday, and that'll be the last one of the of the year for 2020. And then looking forward to picking that back up next year in 2021. And then last but not least, we're just in early stages of working on a commercial uh, slash promotional video for the B BBA. More to come on that. Um, and that's it for the Downtown Business Alliance. Any questions for me? Council, any questions for Omar? I do, Omar. If you would just highlight the trash. I know that we usually do it on Saturdays, but we're doing it on a Friday this time. Um, at noon. Nice. Correct. Yep, you got it, Josh. Yeah, so we're going to do that on Friday at noon. Um, so come bundled up and... Uh, Bring, bring, be ready to be prepared. As, as you guys know, we've been doing this all summer long. So as much as we've stayed on top of it, it typically takes us about 30 minutes to an hour. We'll walk up to the Best Buy and the Les Schwab and then turn back around and we're good to go. So yeah, we invite anybody who wants to join us to be there. Thanks, sir. Excellent. Any other questions? Omar, thanks a bunch. Appreciate all your work. Hey, you bet. Thank you guys. Have a good night. All right, next up is uh, public comment. This is for general public comment. And these are the items, if you, uh, if you wish to address council on an item that is not on the agenda, you'll have to go to our website, parkeronline.org. And there is a form for you to fill out while we're amidst uh, the COVID restrictions. That's how public comment is taken. And then those items are distributed to council. So next up, we've got reports, items, and comments from mayor and council. Mr. Dyack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Last, uh, last week was Dr. Cog week. Um, yeah, fantastic informational items highlighted by uh, Executive Director of the Colorado Energy Office, Will Tour. Um, oh, yes. Yes. Right in from Dr. Cog days. Will, Will was there. Will was there and gave us uh, a little update. Um, uh, I, I had a meeting with uh, our CRP manager, um, deputy, I think, public works director, uh, Chris Hudson. Uh, regarding the High Plains Trail with Centennial. I uh, also attended an E-470 Roadway Committee meeting where we talked about the E-470 and Aurora Parkway uh, overpass, IGA. And uh, one item we, we talked about um, at, uh, I guess, our last study session, I, I kind of want to sort of revisit it. It's more of a time critical issue. Um, there's potentially some excess CARES Act money and, um, you know, I, I think I brought up and there was a little bit of a con concurrence uh, last study session. If we had additional CARES Act money, uh, would it be a, amenable to the, to the council to, to talk about a grant program uh, for small business and nonprofits? Is that something that the council would, would want to talk about at the study session? So, I mean, to, to me, I think that's... So council, just a nod if you're interested in. Okay, you got it. Yeah, right. yep, that's it, thank you. Okay, Debbie. Um, I have a Parks and Rec's liaison meeting next Monday, so I've not done anything, but I wouldn't like to ask you any question. Okay, yeah. Who, who comes up with the little sayings that they put on the EMVs on E470? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, I believe it's the um, the operations uh, staff to do. They don't do want to the No. No, I, I can I can get you a list and, no, and the visual representation. Do you have a or do you, have a, do you want to see something different? It, no, I always find them very entertaining. Do you have a special one that you like? I'm good. I can yeah. I can put them in rotation. <laughs> I, I can request that. Well, they they change some kind of uh, like they had you know yeah. they have a special one pre pre uh, don't be uh, you know afraid or whatever okay. or Halloween they they change them. I'm on there a good day going towards the. Uh, yeah. Pass, pass along, Debbie likes the yeah, stuff. Really? We'll 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 All right, Jeff. Uh, last Tuesday, I had my uh, board of directors meeting with the chamber as a liaison. They are doing phenomenal things there in, in light of COVID. Uh, Kara, actually, we, we had a good conversation about Parker Days, and that's coming back to our staff to have a conversation with the chamber as well. But Kara also uh, started to display their uh, 21 uh, season magazine for the chamber, which will be coming out soon. So looking forward to that. Cheryl. Yeah, um, last week there was a Douglas County housing meeting with the housing partners and they are uh, getting ready to do some construction on a project. It was an older project, but in Castle Rock. Some remodeling and adding some space there. Oak Wood? Pardon? Is it Oak Wood? Yes. <laughs> cool. Josh. Nothing this week, Mr. Mayor. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to our next item, consent agenda. 
Our consent agenda items are considered to be routine and will be enacted with one motion and one vote, unless a council member asks to have something removed for further discussion. Ordinances on the consent agenda are for intro only and will not be removed. Council, you have in front of you consent agenda items 6A through 6G. Mr. Mayor, I move to uh, pull item D from the consent agenda. Okay. We have a motion. I need a second. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion from Jeff and a second from Cheryl to remove item D from the agenda. So um, why don't we do this? Would you, would you amend your motion to approve items A through G with the exception of D? And then we'll hold that separate so we can just get these out of the way. Wait a minute. You've got more? Okay. Then let's just do them individually then. So we have a motion by Josh and a second by Cheryl to remove item D. Jeff. Or Jeff. Jeff. I'm sorry, Jeff. I, I wrote down Jeff. Um, John. Sure. Debbie. Okay. Jeff. Yes. Cheryl. Yes. Josh. Okay. Item D has been removed. Other motions, please. Yes, I'd like to remove item F. From the consent agenda. Okay, we have a motion from Cheryl. Second. We have a second from Jeff on item F. Josh. Yeah. Cheryl. Yes. Jeff. Yes. Debbie. Yes. John. Yep. Okay. You have items A through G, except for D and F. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I move to approve consent agenda items A, B, C, P, e, and G, please. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion from Josh and we have a second from Jeff. Josh? Aye. Cheryl? Aye. Jeff? Aye. Debbie? Aye. John? Yes. Okay, motion passes unanimously. I will need motions or discussions on items D or F. And Mr. Mayor, on item D, I move that we move the first reading of ordinance number 3.308.2 for 60 days up to our first meeting in January. Jim, what's the most appropriate way to do that? Well, so there's two points I want to make. Uh, the first is this is a consent agenda item. It's an ordinance. It's for introduction only. And uh, as you indicated as part of the record, ordinances on the consent agenda are for introduction only and will not be removed for discussion. The second is I would suggest that if you're going to continue uh, an ordinance, particularly land use ordinance, which is subject to notice in public hearing, that you do that the night of the public hearing. That way, anybody that received notice would be at the meeting and then we get notice of the continuance. Otherwise, you're going to force the developer to, to re-notice and republish uh, associated with this particular item. Thanks for pointing out. I didn't realize it was an ordinance. That's my fault on that. So we have a motion from Jeff, but Jeff, do you want to hold your motion or do you want to resend it? Uh, based on that, I'll resend and I'll move to approve ordinance number 3.308.2. So, motion to motion to approve 6D by Jeff and a second from Debbie. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next item is F for resolution 20 054. Now I propose that we move that to the first meeting in December. Okay, so you have a, you're moving to move resolution 20 054 to the first meeting in December. We have a motion from Cheryl. Second. And a second from Jeff. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Yes. yes. I mean, look, I mean it, to me, I, I just want okay. to. Well, just so we, one vote opposed. You need yeah. clarification. Yeah. Okay, so motion to move it fails. So we have item 6F in front of you. If you have further discussion on it. Yeah, I, I just want to sort of. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to understand from uh, Councilman Pope what the what the challenges are on this. Well, outside of seeing what was presented in the agenda, this has never been brought up for discussion in a study session. And since we'll have some council members, I think that it should be saved for that body. But not at the first meeting in December. Well, then second meeting or first meeting in January then. But I think it needs to be deferred. So staff can bring forth exactly what this is, why it is, and I know it meets, you know, an old state statute, but uh, I think they need an opportunity to understand it. Okay. So, Mary, I know this was voted down, uh, but I, I would point out, uh, Council Member Pog, that this is an, but, an, an annual... Moving it was voted down. Moving was voted down, but this is an annual requirement that you have to modify your annexation map 
on an annual basis. So uh, I, I would be fine if you wanted to continue to December 7th. Uh, it's, it's problematic if we wait until uh, 2021 because then we would have essentially violated the statute. So that, that's an uncommon. Is it based on an annual date yeah. or yeah. when was it last adopted? Last year, last year, this time. Okay. But what I guess what, I think, what is the whole what is what is it you don't like about the three mile plan? I just feel that if we're acting on this now, it should wait till the new council is here so they understand what's going so on. We act on it every year. And the statute requires it. Yeah, it's it's so I mean it's not a one time, it's an annual thing. Right. Correct? That's correct. The assembly is more administrative. Well, again, under the annexation act. Uh, you're required to have an, an annexation plan in place in order to annex. And so it's a three mile plan and every year town council about this time approves the, the plan. I don't think it's been modified. So this was approved last year. I mean, this council approved this last year. Correct. Every year. Every year. Okay. I would entertain a motion on 6F, please. Move to approve consent agenda item 6F, please. Second. Motion by Josh and a second by Debbie. All in favor? Aye. Yeah. Nay. Any opposed? No. Nay. So we have uh, three yeses and two noes. Motion passes. Next item up is <laughs> item seven, public hearing. 7A is ordinance number 1.547 on first reading. This is a bill for an ordinance to adopt the 2021 budget and to make appropriations for the same. Mary Lou, you're going to be walking us through this time. I am Mr. Barron. Thank you very much. If you wouldn't mind just telling everyone at home what you do. I am Mary Lou Brown and I am the finance director for the town. And Danette tried to give me my first heart attack in my life when she announced two minutes before we started that she didn't have my presentation. Uh oh. So I was either going to have a heart attack or you're going to have to see me dance. So <laughs> oh, here we go with the presentation. We instead. do have the presentation. <laughs> All right, tonight is the, um, first, the um, first public hearing for the budget. And so if we start with uh, page two, which kind of shows the calendar that we've been on. For those listening in, this is definitely not the first time council has heard me talk about the budget. Internally, we start working on the budget the middle of July. We come in front of council for the very first time with the budget retreat, which happened in, at the end of September. We have had two study sessions where I was available to respond to questions or take questions. We met the legal requirement of posting a budget by October 15th that was posted on the internet. And today we're at November 2nd, which is the first public hearing. The second reading for the adoption of the budget is scheduled for November 16th. And then prior to January 31st, it will be filed with the state and with the GFOA. We move to the next page. Just to kind of highlight again, the guidelines that we used in bringing this forward. The budget is something that the town administrator is required to bring forward to council in a balanced format. So we have done that. And in pulling that budget together, as she and I work together, we use these four um, primary guidelines in creating that budget. So we have the general fund required cash balance, which is an ordinance that was approved by council. We have our focus on combination of employees and citizens. So we have our investment in our employees that we make through our um, performance pay increases and healthcare increases. And we also have addressed the community side through the maintenance and growth of programs for our citizens. And the last item is preparing financially for um, some upcoming strategic infrastructure decisions. That, that will go to the next page and um, take a look uh, in a little more in depth at the um, approach. Did our computer lock up? Technology. Now it's time to dance. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, can we get some dance music coming? <laughs> you help with it. It doesn't like this slide. Is this where it hangs up? There we go. All right. 
So here, um, we're all still dealing with the virus. We're still not certain all of the impacts this year and definitely don't know what all the impacts are in 2021. So that was taken into consideration as we pull together the budget. You'll see as we move into revenue that the revenue growth is um, on the lower end of our typical range. The creation of the savings account. So um, this is how government creates the ability to purchase things. We have to have money um, unless we're going to borrow it in place before we can do something. So we do um, create these funds where we have that savings account. And this is for town infrastructure requirements. This is an area that we've been missing out on up to date. The next item. Oh. Ah. <laughs> the deliberate use of cash balances. Then we go on to, we have limited operational growth. I have a slide that'll look at that. Um, as I mentioned, we make our investment in our employees. So we have our 3% performance pay funding and our commissioned officer step plan in place. We have a contingency in place for our town retirement plans where we're dealing with an issue. And then we also have additional transfers from general fund. But that will take a look at um, our revenue sources in the general fund. And the next couple of pages are really going to be focused on just the general fund. So if you take a look at this, we have our top five revenue sources. And those five revenue sources create um, between 80 and 85% of the total revenue within the general fund. Out of that, obviously, sales taxes are a major source of revenue, and that makes up approximately 70%. I'm going to deviate from budget conversation just briefly here. Um, for an update on our sales tax, we have been ticking down. So we started in July with a year-to-date growth of 8%, August 7%, September 6%. With that trend, we are now in October with a 5% year-to-date growth. So you can see here for the 2020 projection, I've got just under um, or just over 2.5% growth. If we continue the next two months, as we have been, we'll be sitting at about 3%. That is also the um, growth rate that I used for the 2021 sales tax revenue number. From there, we'll go to the next page, which takes a look at our salary and benefits assumptions. Again, I mentioned the 3% um, performance pay and police commissioned officer set plan that accounts for $635,000. Our medical benefits are going up on the town side, 543,000. We have tempered the growth for both the town and the employees by implementing two new plans for 2021 we will stay with our current provider, Cigna, but we will implement their local plus options. So we will have a local plus OAP and a local plus um, high deductible plan also. We will incent employees to um, move to the local plus option because that is an option that does save both the employee and the town the most money. The um, last item under salary and benefits are incremental full-time positions. We have one new position that is included within the Public Works Department. We have three part-time positions that are scheduled to move to full-time, and then we have the increase that council approved for the judge. From there, if we move on to our operational expense, this is where you can see where we've controlled the expenses looking at budget versus budget. So our 2021 budget, our operational expenses budgeted at $12.1 million. Our proposed 2020 budget is at 11.9. That's a 1.7% increase year over year from budget perspective. Included in both um, 2020 and 2021 are some COVID related expenditures. John referenced that a little bit earlier. In the 2020 budget, between these two line items, we have just a little over half a million dollars included. In the 2021 budget, we have $250,000 included. 
Then if we take a look at capital within the general fund, the total capital budget for 2021 is just under $1.3 million. This does exclude our fleet purchases. Those are made out of a different fund. Um, they are charged back to different um, organizations. But within the um, general fund, we have that limited capital because most of our um, public infrastructure projects come out of our public improvements fund. We have 17 projects and or purchases that are included in there. The uh, largest dollar amount, I believe, is for a truck that will have a plow and a spreader um, attached to it. The smallest dollar amount is $14,000 for an enclosed trailer. And in between those two is everything that you can imagine that it takes to run a town. We have traffic signal equipment, data room security expenditures, and replacement of the boiler here at Town Hall. So this um, slide actually summarizes the 2021 budget for uh, the general fund. So if we look at the far right hand column, this is the 2021 budget as it stands right now. We have our beginning cash of $27.4 million, revenue of 56.5, operating expense of 52.9, um, our transfers out for a total expense of 65.5, ending cash of 18.4, and then that all important ratio of our cash to expense were budgeted to be at 28.1%. With that a summary for the general fund, we um, feel that we did achieve the budget guidelines that we set out to follow and have placed the general fund in a solid financial position for 2021. I want to touch on just a couple of our other funds on um, page 12, Danette, the uh, Parks and Recreation Fund. This is our parks and recreation area where the capital projects come out of primarily for them. And so you can see their revenue for 2021 of just over $10 million, expenditures related to approved projects of 13.4, and the ending um, fund balance of 8.1 million. Our recreation fund and then what will follow, our cultural fund are our two funds that are struggling a bit, um, not unexpectedly. This is all due to the um, close, closing down, shutting down, slowing down, however you want to say it, um, of our operations. So if we look at our rec fund, um, you can see here where for 2021, we are expecting the um, fund to end up with $1.3 million. That is down from 2019 of 2.1. Um, I think the um, major takeaway from this, you can see that the 2021 budget for charges for services is actually anticipating growth over 2019. And um, we'll have to see if that's what comes true since unfortunately we're now having to scale back again. With our cultural fund, we see some of the same things. Our ending cash balance due to an incremental $550,000 um, transfer from the general fund in 2020. The 2020 cash balance is um, over, slightly over a million dollars. That falls to about half a million dollars with the 2021 budget. This fund, just like the REC fund, we will be watching as we go through the remainder of 2020 and early, 20 to tw early 2021 to see if we need to make any further adjustments. From there, if we go back um, to page 21 and take a look at our public improvements fund, this is the fund that I mentioned earlier where the majority of our um, streets infrastructure is paid for. Um, it is in a strong position. We have revenue in 2021 of just under 10 million coming in, expenses of 19.5, and an ending fund balance of 19.5. The next page and the page following that are lists of the um, capital projects that are scheduled for 2021. Um, we have a number of them. These are um, listed in no particular order. So um, 
take a look at them. Many of these projects do have revenue coming in from um, other sources that um, offset some of the cost. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Mary Lou. Council, do you have any questions for Mary Lou? Okay. Not seeing any, we'll go ahead and go to public comment at 728 p.m. If there's anyone in our uh, on the Zoom here for public comment, use your raise the hand, raise your hand feature, and uh, we will move you over for comment. Not seeing any, Danette, can you verify? Correct, there are no public comments. Okay, then we'll close public comment at 7.28 p.m. Council, I would entertain further discussion or a motion for item 7A. I have a question for me. Okay. okay. Mary Lou, can you walk me back through this $11 million uh, surplus that we're expecting to see in 2021 and the building of the capital reserve fund? Mayor. I'm sorry, I did, um, Randy Wilkes does have okay. a comment. I apologize. Yes. Okay, so let's go ahead and open public comment back up at 729. And Brandy, you know the routine, state your name and address for the record, and you've got a three minute time limit. Hi, Brandy Wilkes, 17402 East Newtown Parkway, Parker, Colorado, 80134. Ironically enough, that was my exact question too, was just some more clarification on the surplus for the budget, if there was a breakdown of where that surplus was coming from. So that question got asked, which is why I lowered the hand, but that works, so thank you. Okay. Close public comment at 729, and Mary Lou, if you would address Jeff and Brandy's question, that'd be great. I will do so, and Annette, if we can go back to page nine. All right, so the $10 million that um, the budget is showing transferring out from the general fund to the capital facilities reserve fund. That's the question, correct? Yes. All right, so if you look at the beginning cash for 2021, it is $27.4 million. And the ending cash in the 2020 proposed budget is 15.9, so almost $16 million. There is almost a $10 million difference between those two. That is because we are anticipating in our projected 2020 numbers that revenue is actually going to be coming in $10 million higher than what is shown in this proposed budget. This is a result of conversations with council. The, um, add backs and add ins that are for 2020 that were on the consent agenda that we'll have a discussion about in two weeks included there is an increase for our sales tax but not the full amount because at the time that we talked about this council felt that there was enough unknown that we didn't want to increase to the full extent possible so we are sitting with a 10 million dollar pickup from 2020. That is one-time money. And so as we think about this, if I, I'm going to put on my Rhonda hat because Rhonda's our true accountant and she lives in her world and I live in my finance world. But within the world of accounting, we have what is referred to as a matching principle. And so with both GAP and GASB, so the generally accepted accounting principles for the public sector and for GASB, which is our governmental accounting standards, we have to follow that matching principle. So I can't take $10 million and say, I'm going to use that one-time money for operational expense because I've only got that money one time. When I get to 2021, if I used it for operational expense to fund operational expense, I don't have it again in 2022. 
So the way to deal with that then is to use it for one-time sources. Capital is considered a one-time use of funds. We can make that expenditure once. Um, we obviously have an ongoing capital program, but that program is revised each year and it can be responsive to those one-time dollars that are available. So that money is again from, from the most part from 2020. We did have a slightly higher cash balance coming into 2020 after our audit was completed than what we had been expecting. So we picked up a couple million dollars there also. Oh. So, so Mary Lou, what's, what's then the juxtaposition of your first statement of, we started out at eight, we're gonna end up in 3% higher than we expected and to this $10 million. So in the proposed budget, the um, revenue that we are projecting based on that 2.5 or 2.6 percent growth in 2020 is 55.4 million dollars. So that is almost again that 10 million dollar difference in revenue. So we've had that revenue come in, and we're now taking it and moving it as one-time dollars. And and what's the source of that revenue? Is it sales tax? It's all of our revenue for the most part in the general fund, but. Yes, so and sales tax makes up 70%. Okay. And then is is debt retirement, is that a one-time payment? Yes, is so okay. I'll go down that path. So we talked no, no, about- No, I'm just asking if you include that. So you, you're including you know other things, not operational, but it, as long as it's not our day-to-day, -day, so we can't hire a staff member that we're gonna have in 2021, but the council can direct other areas. Yes. As long as it's one time. Yes. Okay, thank you. Could you just for those at home, could you explain what capital really means? Because I know a lot of times people go, does that mean just cash? They don't realize that means things like capital improvements, building, road, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. So when I'm using capital here in the government world, it's not capital um, as people who work um, in the private sector think about it. Capital here is our expenditures for our capital assets. So it's anything that costs over $5,000 and has a life in excess of one year. So we have to plan um, to have cash available for those expenditures and um, we refer to those as capital. So if you think about the um, $55 million of um, expense in the general fund, that really breaks out into two pieces. So it breaks out into our operating expense and it breaks out into um, the one or $2 million of capital expenditures also. It's a common question I get of what capital is. So thank you. Other questions from Mary Lou? Josh. Mary Lou, could you, if you would, um, prior or before the COVID anomaly, could you talk to me a little bit about our descending revenue gen or our sales tax and how we were budgeting 6% and then a 4% growth and then a 2% growth. And this was, 2020 was budgeted at, at what percent growth? So 2020 was budgeted at um, 4%, I believe, three or 4%. Um, I didn't bring my rep at my sales tax slide tonight, um, but we have had a situation here in the town where really since um, 2017, the growth in our sales tax and it's the growth, it's not the absolute dollar amounts, it's that growth percentage has been declining. So we started out um, in 2017, I believe at around 9%, and um, we came down to 4% last year in 2019, we actually popped up, I think we ended up the year around 6%, but um, I can tell you from a budgeting perspective, it's a whole lot easier to budget a lower amount and deal with it coming in a little bit higher than um, having to go the other direction as we've had to do several times now here at the town in the last couple of years. Absolutely, thank you very much. Okay. Other questions, council? Okay, before you guys, you have item 7A, I would entertain a motion then please. I move to approve ordinance number 1.547 on first reading and schedule second reading for November the 16th 2020 as part of the consent agenda. Second. Is that right? No. No, it's not right. Is the second a full public hearing? 
Okay, so that's exactly. the agenda part. Okay, uh, uh, Council, if I could amend my motion. I move to approve the ordinance, ordinance number 1.547 on first reading and to schedule second reading for November the 16th, 2020, as part of the regular agenda. We have a motion from Josh. Second. Second from Debbie. John. Yes. Debbie. Yes. Jeff. Yes. Cheryl. Yes. Josh. All right. Motion passes unanimously. Next item up is item 7B. This is Bowie property annexation and zoning. This was continued from October 5th, 2020. I know there's gonna be one presentation, but we've got three items. So I'm gonna read the three items into the record here. Um, we have item number one, which is resolution number 20-052. This is a resolution to establish the town council's findings of fact and conclusions therein concerning the Bowie property annexation. Item number two is ordinance number 2.274 on second reading. This is a bill for an ordinance approving and accomplishing the annexation of contiguous unincorporated territory known as the Bowie property. And item number three is ordinance number 3.356 on second reading. This is a bill for an ordinance zoning certain property within the town of Parker, Colorado, known as the Bowie property to a agricultural district pursuant to the town of Parker land development ordinance and amending the zoning ordinance and map to conform therewith. Yeah, you. All right, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Town Council. Could this you month. real quick tell everyone at home what you do? Oh, I'm Brianna. I'm an associate planner with the town. Thank you. Uh, the, good evening, Mayor and Town Council. This proposal is to zone the 48.9 acre Bowie property to agricultural in conjunction with an annexation application. The subject property known as the Bowie property is located in unincorporated Douglas County and is surrounded by the town of Parker. The Bowie property is located on the east side of Parker Road, north of Pine Drive, and south of Parker Adventist Hospital. The subject property is approximately 49 acres in size and owned by the Bowie Family Partnership, LLLP. The town is proposing an enclave annexation of the Bowie property and will zone the property A Agricultural District which is the town zoning most similar to the existing county zoning. The Bowie property has been completely surrounded by the town of Parker for a period of not less than three years and is considered an enclave under the Municipal Annexation Act of 1965. The town has committed to a policy of actively pursuing the annexation of enclaves. The subject property is located within the town's planning area described in, Park, in the Parker 2035 master plan. The general land use map within the Parker 2035 master plan identifies this property as being within the medical character area. The property is represented by a red rectangle in the center of the map. The medical designation recommends medical care, preventive health care, and a business environment. The subject property is located along Parker Road surrounded by properties within the town boundaries and is located within the town's growth boundary. The annexation and zoning fulfills the town of Parker's goals of actively pursuing annexations of enclaves and roads to allow for continuity of services within the Parker 2035 planning area. Staff has reviewed the proposal and has determined that the project is consistent with the master plan, provides adequate access, infrastructure, drainage facilities, and design considerations, and the project will not result in additional municipal service costs. The project satisfies the nine criteria required in the land development ordinance for, to rezone the property and referral agency comments have been addressed. Planning Commission heard this item on October 2nd of 2020 and recommended approval. Additionally, staff sent three letters to the property owner concerning this annexation. Staff has not heard from the property owner at this time. Therefore, staff and Planning Commission recommend that Town Council approve the Bowie Enclave property rezoning. Staff is available for any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Council, do you have any questions for Brianna before we go to public comment? Cheryl? Yeah, on your three attempts to communicate with property owners, how was that done? It was via mail. It was fine? No. Why not? Uh, there were no requirements that it was certified, so we just sent it via regular first class mail. Other questions? Sure. Yeah, I just feel that certified would have been appropriate. Okay. 
All right, we're going to go ahead and open it up for public comment at 7.43 p.m. If the three people who are in our attendee list have public comment, use your raise your hand feature, please. Okay. Yeah, would you move Laura over? Okay. All right, Laura, you will have a, if you could state your name and address for the record, please, and you know the rules with the three minute time limit. You go ahead and unmute yourself too, Laura. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council, count, Town Council members. My name is Laura Hefta, and I am at 18236 Shadbury Lane, Parker, Colorado, 80134. And I did want to address the mail issue on this matter. Um, in Parker, um, I would just tell you from a regular citizen's perspective that um, I've had some mail troubles in getting bills from various dental offices and I have most moved most of my bill paying online. And in this particular case, um, I believe that a property owner should have adequate notice when something is going to be annexed onto their land. Um, and that um, certified mail would be appropriate in this situation. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do it um, before you take legal action on someone's property. Um, you can send regular mail twice and the third time certified mail. Uh, but I will tell you um, from the military perspective, the United States Army and the Department of Defense, whenever we're going to take a serious legal action against someone on a matter, a certified mail is the norm. Um, and that way, the rights of the individual are ensured if any administrative action is taken against them. Um, no knock on the Postal Service, but um, certified mail is a surefire way um, to ensure that the person's legal rights have been recognized, they've signed for the mail, and then that can be entered into the record on an administrative basis, and the action can proceed smoothly um, if they've signed for that piece of mail. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak to this issue tonight. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. Brandy, did you raise your hand as well? What was that? No? No, she did not. Oh, oh she no. just did. Okay. If you could move, there you go. Hey, Brandy, same thing. If you'd state your name and address for the record, please, and there's a three minute time limit. Yep, Brandy Wilkes, 17402 East Newtown Parkway, Parker, Colorado, 80134. So um, I don't know what all steps have been taken and what the letter was taken. However, when um, campaigning, I was looking for permission to put my banner up on that land. And it took me about an hour, but I was actually able to come up with the guy's um, address and his son and daughter who live right here in Aurora. And so I'm just curious um, because their phone numbers are public records. I actually left a couple messages. Um, were there any other steps taken to get a hold of their next of kin who just happened to live in Aurora as well, or the person himself, or was it just sent via mail? Because um, I was able to pretty easily with my lack of um, resources that the town has um, get more contacts available. So I just am curious what other steps or if it was just the letters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment on this item? Use your raise the hand feature if you have. Okay, not saying any. Did no other comments. Okay. Well, can I address the notice question? Sure. Well, let me close public right. comment at 7.47 p.m. Mr. Maloney, please. So there are two notice requirements and as a municipality, we follow state law. There's also a town code provision which deals with notice. There's basically four types of notice for an annexation. So under the annexation statute, the statute specifically provides that notice has to be posted in the newspaper for five successive weeks. That happened here. Now our town code takes over. The town code makes it very clear. We also put notice on the town's website. We also mail notice. And the notice requirement for mail notice is first class mail, not certified mail. That was a town council decision. It was discussed certified mail versus first class mail. Town council made the decision. 
first class mail, that's what's in your code. The property is also posted. It was posted for the planning commission meeting. The property was also posted for the town council meeting. And I believe that Brianna did indicate that all notice requirements satisfied under both the state statute and under town code. Does that help? Thank you for the clarification, absolutely. Okay, council, further discussion on this item? There's three of them in front of you. Brianna, could you go a little bit more into depth about the, um, the zoning? Uh, Douglas County is compared to Parker zoning and, and the equality, equality of those zonings, please. So currently in the county, it's agricultural. So moving into agricultural in the town is fairly consistent. When there is development to occur on the site, they will rezone it to a more appropriate zoning for development. Thank you very much. Other questions, council? Otherwise, I would entertain motions on the three items. I move to approve resolution number 20 052. Second. We have a motion from Josh and we have a second from Debbie. Josh. Aye. Cheryl. No. Jeff. Aye. Debbie. Yes. John. Yes. Motion passes with one no vote from Cheryl Pogue. Next item number two. We move to approve ordinance number 2.274 on second reading. Second. Motion by Josh and a second by Debbie. John. Yes. Debbie. Yes. Jeff. Aye. Cheryl. No. Aye. Josh. Okay, motion passes with one no from Cheryl Pogue. Next item. I move to approve ordinance number 3.356 on second reading. Second. We have a motion from Josh and a second from Debbie. Josh. Aye. Cheryl. No. Jeff. Aye. Debbie. Yes. John. Yes. Motion passes with one no vote from Cheryl Pogue. Next item up is item eight, ordinances. 8A is ordinance number 4.53.8 on second reading. This is a bill for an ordinance to amend subsection 10.09.010A of the Parker Municipal Code concerning the roadway design and construction criteria, criteria manual. Alex. Oh man, the beard's looking good too. The mask was hiding it. I thought you still had the same, you know. Thank you very much. Mr. Looking sharp. Well, thank you and good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Alex Nesson with the Town's Engineering Department. Uh, my department has prepared a set of proposed revisions to the Town's Roadway Design and Construction Criteria Manual for the Council's consideration tonight. To provide a brief history of the manual, it was originally adopted in 1994 and has been revised five times since, most recently in 2018. The manual sets forth minimum standards and criteria for the design and construction of all public roadways within the Town. The last revision that came before you in 18 focused on revisions to the town's pavement design criteria. That's actually what the key revisions tonight that are being proposed, proposed tonight will be as well. Um, the pavement design criteria ensures that roadways constructed within the town have adequate pavement sections and subgrade to hold up to the traffic they are anticipated to carry. <clears throat> so on the proposed 2020 revisions, a complete summary of the proposed changes were included in tonight's packet. If the council has any questions about any of those items, I can certainly address those. Um, staff would characterize most of the proposed revisions as minor in nature. Uh, many of them were clarifications to existing criteria or small changes to some of our standard details. There are the two key revisions I would like to provide more information for you on tonight. Um, again, they're both related to our pavement design criteria. The first change would add a minimum asphalt thickness for collector and arterial roadways. And the second change would add a requirement to use a stronger SMA asphalt mix for surface lifts on arterial roadways. To start with the minimum asphalt thickness change, um, it is a pretty straightforward change. Currently, the town's criteria calls for a five inch minimum asphalt thickness on local roadways. Um, there is no minimum currently stated for collector and arterial roadways, which for the council's uh, benefit, those are our more major roadways that carry higher, higher volume of traffic, more truck traffic, that kind of thing. Um, really, it hasn't created an issue historically. You know, we've gotten pretty good pavement sections from developers in the past. Um, but, you know, we really, staff would like to set, go ahead and set a minimum asphalt thickness for those roadways, just to set clear expectations for developers and also to kind of head off any conflicts that might come should we get substandard pavement sections proposed to the town. So this revision proposes to add a six inch minimum thickness for residential collector roadways and then an eight inch minimum thickness for non-residential collectors and arterial roadways. Um, 
the town basically already uses these depths on our capital projects and they're really in line with what other jurisdictions um, kind of our neighboring counties and, and cities are doing as well. So the second change was regarding SMA mix requirements. Um, really, th this would add a requirement to use what's called stone mastic asphalt or SMA on all our Chirigo roadways within the town. SMA basically it's a more durable, more rut resistant asphalt mix. It's typically used on high traffic roadways. Some of your, your major highways, your major state highways, um, really the roads are gonna carry a lot of truck and, and high traffic volumes. Um, there are agencies throughout the metro area that currently do use SMA for the top course of their major roadways. I've listed those here, you know, Seed Out Aurora are the most um, familiar to our residents that use those on some of their more major roadways. Um, the town actually used SMA on two of our resurfacing projects this past year. Um, those are Crown Crest Boulevard from Parker Road to the east, and then Dransville Road um, south of Lincoln Avenue down to about Plaza. SMA does cost more. It costs about 30% more than standard surface course asphalt. When you project that on an entire pavement section with a subgrade and base lifts of asphalt, it's about 5% more for the entire pavement section. Um, you know, based on what town staff has observed in other jurisdictions that use this, we're pretty confident that the, 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 the improved performance and longevity of the roadway that we'll get would offset that added cost. Um, really, what we're looking to do here is to invest more up front to make our maintenance dollars go further down the way. We think that we'll be able to push out some of our more major maintenance activities using this material. You know, our mill and overlays, our reconstructs. We think we can delay those longer and make our maintenance dollars again go further down the road. So we think it's a net benefit long term to our roadway maintenance program. This next slide um, is really just to illustrate where we would use the SMA based on this proposed revision. Um, what you have in front of you is a typical section from a town capital project um, that shows kind of the roadway. I believe this was from Chambers Road, um, which the town constructed about three years ago. Um, you can see the different layers of pavement that are in there. This particular road had nine and a half inches of HMA or hot mix asphalt. Um, under that was a 12 inch layer of aggregate base course or rock. And then there's you know, some additional subgrade work below that. But we'd be looking at the top two inches, the surface course of our asphalt roadways that would use this SMA. So it is a pretty small portion of the overall pavement section. So again, this, this proposed requirement would require all projects in the town, so capital and development projects, to use a two-inch SMA surface course for arterial roadways on, that are, those are our major roads, that's Stroh Road, Chambers Road, Hess Road, et cetera. Um, really adding this formula to the criteria, what it allows staff to do is to obligate developers to use this. Um, you know, we can, the town can always use this in our projects if we choose to, but adding it formally to the manual allows us to obligate developers to do so. Um, you know, the, the one caveat to that is this project or this product, SMA, does have to be installed during the summer months. It's very temperature dependent, so it can't be installed during cooler times in the spring and the fall when standard asphalt can be paved. So we recognize we may have to be a little bit flexible with developers at times, and probably what that looks like is a cash in lieu option. If they're ready to pave surface course late in the fall, or, or we're just not going to get temperatures for another six months, we would probably allow them to pay to the town the cash in lieu, the extra cost of the SMA instead. So. That's the one caveat we would have to that. And so finally, um, this, this, these provisions were sent out for outside review and referral. Um, they were sent out to all agencies with an interest in town criteria through the town's e-tracking system. Um, the changes were also discussed with the town's development liaison committee, the DLC. Um, that's, a, that's a committee of local developers who provide the town with feedback on development related issues. Overall, we received a handful of comments from our outreach. Um, most of them were suggestions about additional changes. None were in opposition to any of these changes. So that concludes my presentation tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions the council has. Thank you. Alex, thanks a bunch. Council, questions? Josh. All right, Alex, can you talk about the, the how long, how much longer does SMA versus HMA? And what does that do when getting growth to pay for it? What does that do to our citizens in perpetuity as, as far as having to rebuild or repay the road? Yeah, I mean, we think it's, it's hard to say, you know, it's road dependent on, on what with the traffic loading, traffic volumes are on the road. We think we could push out some of our major maintenance activities, you know, four, five, six years down the road. And really that just has a cascading effect on our overall maintenance program. It's less, you know, our, again, it stretches our dollars further. We're able to address more pressing issues sooner. Um, it has a, a pretty big benefit to our maintenance program. And then second question on the cash in lieu. Um, obviously, if it only can be done in summer, then conveniently they won't be able to do it in summer and they'll be stuck doing HMA. But the cash in lieu would essentially say, even if you can't do it 
you have to give money to the town so we can do it when your road runs out in 10 years. That's correct. And obviously our first preference is going to be to have developers actually put this in up front. I mean, now that they have it, we have it, if we have it in the criteria, they'll be, they should be able to plan for it. You should be able to say up front, we expect you to put this in in the summer, plan around it. Now, who knows what happens with weather and other utility issues. A number of things can happen, but we will have that option. But obviously our first preference is to have it put in from the start and have it there from the get-go. Thank you, sir. Other questions? Yes. Sure. Yes, under section six, we talk about the truck percentage to be used in asphalt pavement designs. Mm -hmm. What was it currently? Was it totally absent? And what are you looking at with this? Correct. So currently our, our design calculation method does not have a minimum truck percentage. It has to be assumed um, when they're calculating the loading on the roadway. We're proposing 4%. That is pretty standard um, with other jurisdictions. It's really what we usually see. We're putting in there because we did have one project that tried to assume, I think, one and a half or two percent this year. And so there was a lot of back and forth to get that back where it needed to be. So we want to go ahead and have that in there to make sure it's accounted for up front. Is there anything in there that talks about the type of truck, the weight it's carrying? Yeah, it's based pretty issues. Yep, it's, it's standard going into those, um, you know, looking into what the, the method we use, which is an AASHTO, an American Highway, American Association of State Highways and Transportation Organizations. Um, the loading is standard. It's a standard delivery truck that's used in those calculations. And the second question is, will this um, change affect pending permits that have not been completed or is it, when does it start? So any application that's already been, I think the distinction we've made is any project that's under construction currently, we would not be able to retroactively apply this to, but any project that has not gone to construction yet, we would look to apply this to. Thank you. Other questions? Nope. We were mesmerized by the door. The ghost in the room? Yeah, the door to the back that miraculously opened itself up behind Jim Serapis and then just now miraculously closed itself behind it. So we were kind of focused on that a little bit. All right. With no other questions, thank you, Alex. We're going to go ahead and open up public comment at 7.59 p.m. If there's anyone, if either, either Brandy or Laura have a question, go ahead and use your raise your hand feature. No questions. Seeing none, we'll close public comment at 8 p.m. and I would entertain further discussion or a motion, please. Uh, I move to approve ordinance number 4.53.8 on second reading. Second. We have a motion from John and we have a second from Debbie. John. Yes. Debbie. Yes. Jeff. Yes. Cheryl. Yes. Josh. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Next item up is 8B. This is ordinance number 9.280.1 on second reading. This is a bill for an ordinance to approve the third replacement intergovernmental dispatch services agreement by and between the town of Parker and the city of Lone Tree. Jamie, are you going to lead us or is Big Dog going to lead us? I'm going to lead. All right. <laughs> Jamie Wynn, I'm the assistant town attorney. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and town council members. We are here before you today to ask you to approve ordinance number 9.280.1 to approve the third replacement intergovernmental dispatch services agreement between Parker and Lone Tree. The town of Parker and the city of Lone Tree have been involved in an agreement to join dispatch services to, since 2005. That agreement has been previously amended with this amendment for the third intergovernmental agreement, we have made mostly administrative changes. We have cleaned up some of the sections. The main changes for this intergovernmental agreement are the formula used to calculate the proportionate costs for the two entities, as well as determining the finance, finances going forward. We have worked with our finance department who has requested that we do a lag year to allow for finance to run the numbers appropriately and to give time to input those numbers into the agreement going forward. Those are the two main changes. We are happy to answer any specific questions. Thank you very much. Council, questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll open it for public comment at 8.02 p.m. Brandy and Laura, if you have any questions, go ahead and use your raise your hand feature. Brandy has one. Would you go ahead and move her over? Brandy, Hi. state your name and address for the record, please. Yep, Brandy Wilkes, 17402 East Newtown Parkway, Parker, Colorado, 80134. My only question is, um, and I might have misunderstood it, but the taking a lag year um, for the financials to be reviewed, does that mean um, not having dispatch cover Parker and Lone Tree for a year, or 
Did I misunderstand that? Okay, thank you very much. Laura, did you have a question? It looks like Brandy, you were the only Oh, Laura, you do have a question. Laura, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record, we'll do all the answers at the same time. Laura did not raise her hand. Oh, it looked like she got, she got moved. Oh yeah, no worries, just check it. All right, we'll go ahead and close public comment at 8.03 p.m. and Jamie. The laggard does not put a lag in for the actual dispatch services. What it does, it allows the finance department to take the budget from this year and use it as the budget for next year as well. Therefore, we don't have as tight of a time frame to try to get all the numbers approved. We did get this IGA approved by Lone Tree on October 20th, but it's usually a squeeze to try to get both town entities to approve it. So it just gives that lag with calculating the numbers. So next year's will be based on 2020's budget, 2022 will be based on 2021's budget and so forth. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, with that, I'd entertain further discussion or a motion, please. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I just uh, want to state, I, I truly appreciate the work done in this. Um, I think it's a great example of the partnership that we have in Douglas County, our sister city, um, recognizing that we have a great dispatch in our wonderful police station and then allow, allowing them to uh, supplement, if you will, those dispatchers and not having to have redundancies that are needed. I think citizens of both Lone Tree and Parker should, should really appreciate that. And I appreciate the work that was done here by both chiefs. Thank you very much, and the staffs. Cheryl. Yeah, um, what is the cost effectiveness for each entity with this type of agreement? I think that it's a proportionate cost for both entities. I, I believe that both are paying their proportionate share. It saves Lone Tree money because they don't have to create their own dispatch center and they basically pay for the services they utilize from Parker, including benefits, staffing, and all equipment. So that's their benefit. What's Parker's benefit? We receive the funds from the city of Lone Tree funding issue. For, correct. It's a, fund, it's a funding and they also help uh, pay for some of the staffing and dispatch as well. Okay. I would entertain a motion then, please. I move to approve ordinance number 9.280.1 on second reading. Second. Second. We have a motion from Debbie and we have a second from Cheryl. Josh. Aye. Cheryl. Aye. Jeff. Aye. Debbie. Yes. John. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Next item up is item 8C. This is ordinance number 5.02.7 on second reading. This is a bill for an ordinance to amend section 3.01.080 of the Parker Municipal Code concerning trials. I don't have my glasses on and I almost said trails. Trials. Jamie. That's all right. I spell it trails more often than I <laughs> can for spell check and grammar check. Good evening again, Mayor and Council members. I am asking you to approve on second reading ordinance number 5.02.7 to amend the current municipal code with respect to trials. Currently, the town of Parker's municipal code charges a jury fee of $45 for a jury trial request. However, we have determined that that fee is not consistent with the state's municipal court rules as handed down by the Colorado Supreme Court. Therefore, in order to be consistent with the court rule requirements, we are seeking an amendment for jury trial fees to be $25. Okay. And Council. I am open to any questions regarding that. Council, any questions for Jamie? Never had to do a jury trial, so I'm just... You've always wanted to be on a jury? All right, seeing no questions, we'll open it up for public comment at 8.06 p.m. Brandy or Laura, if you have a question, use your raise your hand feature, please. There are no public comments, Mayor. Okay, we'll close public comment at 8.06 and I'd entertain further discussion or a motion, please. I move to approve the ordinance number 5.72.1 on second reading. Second. We have a motion from Debbie and a second from Jeff. Josh. Aye. Cheryl. Aye. Jeff. Aye. Debbie. Yes. John. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Next item up is item D. This is ordinance number 5.72.1 on second reading. This is a bill for an ordinance to amend section 8.08.060 of the Parker Municipal Code concerning display, consumption, or use of marijuana in public places. Jamie. All right, me again. Uh, we are seeking town council approval to amend the Parker Municipal Code under ordinance number 5.72.1 for the section of the code dealing with 
display consumption or use of marijuana in public places. Currently, the Town of Parker Municipal Code, with respect to all marijuana provisions, has a penalty of up to $100 fine being imposed. This section did not have any specific penalty included in it. Therefore, we are seeking the amendment to include the up to $100 fine being imposed for any violations under this section. And I'm happy to answer any questions regarding that modification. Thank you very much. Council, any questions on this item? Are there any questions? I was trying to work in some like marijuana references like hi or, you know, don't let it go up in smoke, but then, okay, obviously none. So Weldy's shaking her head. That means I've gone too far. Let's go ahead and open up public comment at 8.08 p.m. If there's any public wishing, Laura has her hand raised. Okay, Laura, if you could state your name and address for the record, please. Unmute, why don't you unmute yourself first, though? There you thank go. you. I'm quite not getting the hang of this phone. Okay, thank you. My name is Laura Hefta, Mr. Mayor and Town Council members, and I'm at 18236 Shadbury Lane, Parker, Colorado, 80134. Um, yes, and so I just want to ask again, just for public uh, consumption, um, where this information will be posted so people understand in our town that there is a fine increase for uh, smoking marijuana in public. Um, where can we find that information? Where will it be posted for all the members of our community to know? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Randy, did you raise your hand if you have a question? If not, we'll go ahead and close public comment at 8.09 p.m. And Jamie, just clarify, because it's not an increase. Correct. And there's no increase in fine. It's just cleaning up and clarifying, correct? Correct. Technically, it's potentially a decrease in the fine. The current fine would, because there's no specific provision, would fall under the general section of 8.01.040, which could be a fine up to $499 and potentially jail time. So this is to set the specific fine and make it consistent with the other marijuana provisions, which are all up to $100. So technically it's potentially a decrease, although I believe our court has generally been imposing consistent fines when the court does see these type of violations. And is there any place that this is made public when this happens? It's included in the municipal code, which is accessible through, I think, Muni Code Library online. If you go to the Town of Parker website, you can also type in the municipal code and it will take you to that link. Excellent, thank you very much. With that, Council, I would entertain further discussion or a motion, please. I move, I move to approve ordinance number 5.72.10, second reading. I'm on the wrong one. Nope, you're back. Second. We have a motion from Debbie, and we have a second from John. John? Yes. Debbie? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Josh? Hi. Motion passes unanimously. With no further business before council, um, we're gonna have our P3 meeting next. So uh, sit tight, those at home if wanted to see. With no further business before council, we'll adjourn at 8, 11 p.m.